Uh, it's an honor to be here, and I wish I could tell you that uh, my, my sling is the result of an encounter with an escaped hobo from Sing Sing <laughs> crossing the border with um, heavy weaponry of some kind, but in fact, uh, I was walking the dog <laughs> on a uh, wet day with slippery leaves, and, and isn't that just like life. Um, I, uh, I've done a few scary things, and I don't think I've, no, I've never been hurt as badly as this, doing any of the things that uh, I write my books about, and I don't know what the moral of the story is. Um, I, do, uh, I do enjoy entering uh, into the stories I write about. It's partly because I'm curious about the ways other people live. I feel I was brought up in a fairly normal way, and one of the great advantages of, of having uh, gotten through high school, having gotten through college, uh, having some good instruction along the way is, is, um, is I like writing, or at least I like having written, but I also have the, the wherewithal to try other things for a while. That is, I could take a semester off of college, which I, which I did, to live with railroad tramps or hobos. Um, my idea initially was to write a, uh, an honors thesis on that subject. My professors pointed out that that was illegal, and um, I couldn't argue. They were right, but they were good enough to say that if I did it on my own time and then came back with, with good notes, they would help me write the thesis. And, uh, and I did. And along the way, I both learned a lot. I expanded my education. And then I had um, you know, a first-person experience, which is what all my friends wanted to hear about when I got back to school. They were kind of interested in hobo conceptions of time and space. But what they really wanted to know was, um, how did you uh, introduce yourself? How did you just walk up to people? How come they didn't rob you all the time? How come? Um, you know, how did, how did you know what to do? And so, as I was graduating, I thought, you know, there's a whole version of this I haven't written yet, and it's the version of kind of what riding the rails w was like and what those people were like, but all through my experience. So, to me, that, it, it sort of uh, suggested something. I've got a few pictures here. These are people I met. This is a woman who lives in the, um, or she was living in the freight yards in Bakersfield, California. Um, she would built this kind of hut for herself out of old tires. And uh, uh, I said, gosh, so doesn't anybody bother you? And she showed me a big knife she kept underneath um, one of those tires. And she said, no. <laughs> um, and uh, this is a guy named Dick who's rolling his own cigarette on a, uh, a flat bed car with a container over his head, and it's going about 60 miles an hour across the desert in Nevada. And it's not easy to roll or to smoke in that kind of wind, but um, he was a very resourceful guy, and he let me hang out with him for a while. Uh, these are two guys I spent about 10 days with. Um, I, have, I don't even remember how this picture got taken. That's me on the left, and one thing I want you to notice is I've on the right, excuse me. <laughs> I'm carrying more stuff than either of them. And that is intentional because the main fear rail riders had about me was that I was there to rob them, which is kind of hilarious given um, that I'm not very big or very tough or experienced at robbing people. But uh, that's what especially the older ones feared is I needed some stuff that they might have. So I made a point of, of having extra stuff. I often had some extra food. Um, I, I was actually smoking during this period of time, so I was generous with my cigarettes. Um, and I mostly just didn't want to scare them. Um, that's a picture my sister took when I got back. And I include it mainly just to show you that um, I'm not a I'm not purely in it for the journalism. I'm also in it because 
I'm fascinated by identities and the different roles that each of us grows into as we uh, as we come of age in this country, and um, uh, you know everything from different sort of professional roles to gender stereotypes to class behavior to uh, ethnic behavior that sort of we adopt because of how we were raised. And I find it really interesting to try and cross some of those lines and see how the world looks from other people's point of view. So um, the lucky thing is that if you want to write about something serious like hard times in America, it gives you a way. Because I, my feeling is that most Americans' first choice for entertainment um, is less likely to be a, a good book than uh, Dancing with the Stars or uh, uh, what? Checking Facebook. Uh, that's what my kids certainly do all the time. And um, I don't blame them one bit, but I think it shows that if you want to be a writer, you have to think about your audience and think, how am I going to? make people want to be with me, want to spend time reading a book, which is not the easiest thing in the world to do. Um, uh, so the strategy is to make the story seem more familiar by putting myself in it. And um, uh, you know, writers use all kinds of strategies to get readers to focus on important issues. Uh, Upton Sinclair is really famous for his uh, uh, novel, The Jungle. You know, it's been called a muck-raking novel. It's not a phrase we hear much anymore. Novelists um, bringing up big social issues. Right now, you know, we'd be more likely to read Fast Food Nation by Eric Schlosser and learn about the food industry that way. But back then, it was done through novels. The Grapes of Wrath is another one that focused a lot of people's attention on social issues just through excellent writing uh, and the incredible drama and empathy of Steinbeck. Um, but I think these things can be done in nonfiction as well. Most often in our times, they're done in memoir. So uh, I understand uh, Wilbert uh, Rideau was here yesterday, uh, reading from his memoir, In the Place of Justice. Um, he had an amazing life, spent his adult life spent in prison. And, uh, and he's an excellent writer, and he wrote a great book. Um, but all kinds of people have made books out of their difficult lives. Carolyn Shute wrote a book called The Beans of Egypt, Maine, which is about growing up with you know very poor white people in Maine. Uh, the Glass Castle by Jeanette Wall, and The Belly of the Beast by Jack Henry Abbott, another prison one. Or, or just books like This Boy's Life by Tobias Wolf. Uh, you know, uh, an account of growing up in a singular and often difficult situation. So that's memoir. Just so we're clear, memoir is generally categorized as nonfiction, though it's the most uh, soft kind of nonfiction, because people remember things in different ways, and memoirs are not all, um, they're not held to the same, same standards of factual accuracy as uh, books of reportage. So a couple of examples of those might be um, Waiting for Sheetrock by Melissa Fay Green or Random Family by Adrienne Nicole Blanc. Um, there's an interesting book called Methland by Nick Redding, which is about, it's about a, a reporter from Chicago, goes down, I think it's in Iowa. Has anybody read this book? Uh, to write about a little town with a lot of shift labor, a lot of factories where everybody uses meth. And he writes about the people who make it, the people who abuse it, the families that are badly affected by it. And he doesn't just interview, he, he goes and lives there. I wouldn't be, I'm, I'm trying to remember how much meth he used himself. I know he tries it in the book. And though that is um, a bad idea and against the law, um, um, participation brings an authenticity that you don't just get by emailing people or even by picking up the phone. To, to go and do something yourself gives you an authority that you cannot otherwise have. So. Um, um, let me just say one other thing. Another good example, before I forget, is Barbara Ehrenreich's book, uh, Nickel and Dimed. 
again, she, that's participatory. She works as a waitress, tries to get by on minimum wage, works as a housekeeper in a hotel. Um, I like to think you can go even deeper, though. And don't just spend a month, spend six months, or spend a year, because then, let's say your job is in a prison, you're not talking about the prison guards anymore. You're not even talking about correction officers or COs. You, you start talking in the first person plural. So you say, we. We don't like it when that happens. We, we're uncomfortable in these situations. And you, um, you've, you, you've started to identify in a way that's, um, you know, it's going to wear off because that's not maybe who you are. But if you do it long enough, you do start thinking about things from a different vantage point. And I try, uh, that's, I think my best work comes from that kind of experience. So 